Education Commission, can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Sandy Brown, here. Commissioner Montesino, here. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin, here. Commissioner Alternate Quinn, You're on mute, Commissioner Quinn. Commissioner Quinn, can you hear us? I don't think he can hear us. Okay, we'll send him a message. Uh, Commissioner McKeithen? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Christian Brown? Here. Commissioner Larry, uh, Commissioner Pegler? Here. And you have a quorum. All right. We'll move on to consideration of AB 2449 Just Cause and Emergency Circumstances Requests. We have none. I was, I was unmuting, unmuting the, the Commissioner. Commissioner Quinn, can you hear us? Like it might be frozen. <laughs> so we do have um, Commissioner Quinn, and we are expecting Commissioner Kitos Carter to be joining us remotely. They both will be using the regular Brown Act. Their remote access location that is open to the public was posted on the uh, agenda. Great, thank you. And we do not have any AB 2449. Okay. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to our consent or regular agendas today? We have posted uh, a revised agenda and handouts for items 23 and 24. Thank you. Okay, we will move on now to item four, oral communications. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the commission on any item uh, that is not on today's agenda. And we'll start with those uh, in chambers. Seeing none. Okay, we will go uh, to public comment online. Jean Brockbank. Hello, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Jean Brocklebank. I am 79 and a half years old. In Santa Cruz County, this week's headline read, Santa Cruz woman killed in area's first fatal e-bike collision this year. This happened on Opal Cliff Drive, where there are no sidewalks. But I submit where it happened is irrelevant. Wringing our hands about the lack of sidewalks or bike lanes will not do anything to give that poor woman her life back. It will take years to redevelop this county for pedestrian safety. And the operators of speeding electric bikes will continue to dominate our neighborhoods. And now to a matter I feel is relevant in this regard. For safety's sake, with increased electric bike usage, obviously in the rail trail, it's happening. If the RTC cannot fit both rail and a trail of a minimum of 12 foot wide in the right of way, not some 11 feet, not some 10 feet, I'm saying a minimum of 12 foot wide, then there are only two options that make any sense at this juncture. One is to divert the rail trail out of the corridor, a really lame idea that defeats the whole purpose of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. Two is to build the EIR's proposed projects optional interim trail down the center of the right-of-way since doing so does not preclude future rail rail banking is not required assurances by the rtc that a speed limit for e-bikes can be established must be strongly challenged by asking how much speed limit how such a speed limit will be enforced 24 7. the answer that it was built will be complaint driven Safety matters. The dead woman's life matters. I ask that the RTC to take this pedestrian death seriously and take a deep rethink about what it is doing in the rail corridor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Michael Saint. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Brown and commissioners. Uh, Michael Saint, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation and Aptos resident. I was unable to attend last month's meeting, 
Uh, although a month late, I would like to congratulate Sarah Christensen for being elected, appointed as our new executive director of the RTC and wish her the best in her new position. I would also like to thank uh, Mitch Weiss for his efforts and hard work filling in as interim executive director after the retirement of Guy Preston. Now that we are talking about changes, uh, we do have an opportunity um, in November elections to vote for candidates that could change the direction of, or at least bring a new perspective to the RTC and our district supervisors positions on transportation issues. Here are the five shifts we need to transform our transportation system to meet our climate goals. Expanding the infrastructure around public transportation systems, reduce avoidable vehicle miles traveled, especially single occupancy vehicles, expand dedicated walkways and bike paths, shift to public shared and non-motorized transport, and we definitely need to transition to zero carbon cars, trucks, and buses. One of the things you do not see mentioned when you Google this subject on climate change is widening highways is never mentioned to help meet our climate goals. And relating to zero carbon transfer of cars and trucks, I'd like to invite everybody this Saturday, October 5th to Watsonville on behalf of Ecology Action to participate in uh, driving, test driving, or looking at electric vehicles. Um, to maybe transition if you are thinking about going to electric vehicle. Thank you so much. Mr. Bernassa. Yes, Ben Bernassa, Aptos. <clears throat> we all have to be concerned now that we've had this problem in the southeastern United States and famous funds <clears throat> are going to be used up we won't be getting refunds. Congress will not be able to pass a bill to pay for all the refunds. So we have to think, take things in our own hands now to eliminate the, the potholes and the, the cave-ins. And we can do that by amending the Ordinance D. All it takes is a necessity, a show of necessity. And we have to have this problem solved now. We can't let it go on for years. And the provision is that you provide an amendment, suggestions, it goes to the four city councils, it goes to the board of supervisors, and it can be passed. And when it's passed, it can be for two years or one year, it can be temporary. So let's look at the allocation of funds. Now 8% goes to rail corridor options and studies. Man, we've spent millions of dollars, billions of dollars. We can take half of that and move it up to cities and counties instead of 30%, 34% and use it for this. And let's go to FEMA and say, look, we're giving up future planning. For instance, we have four and a half million dollars if we do. Can you match it? And also, we'll give you credit for $5 million, but just match the four and a half, that leaves a half a million dollars for other states and cities and counties in the United States. Thank you. My suggestion, think about it. There, it's not the exact answer, but think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further public comment? We do not have any others online. All right, thank you. With that, we will go to review of our items to be discussed in closed session. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The item for closed session today is related to labor negotiations for the uh, RAM group. Um, this is also related to item 13 on your agenda, and the commission did receive the staff report that was sent out and posted yesterday for that item. Um, if the commission doesn't have any questions on the information that's in the staff report, and the commission doesn't need to conduct the closed session. So if you do have questions, we should go into a closed session. If you don't, we can remove the closed session from the agenda. Okay, we'll take a moment to see if anyone would like to go into closed session with questions on this item. Okay, seeing none, I guess we will move along. Correct. Thank okay, uh, with that, uh, there will be no item six because we're not going into closed session. There will be no item seven because we have nothing to report on from the closed session we didn't go into. 
So that will bring us to our consent agenda. Are there any questions or would any member of the commission like to remove an item from consent? Seeing none, is there any public comment? Seeing none in the room, any online? No, okay. Move Great. the consent agenda. We have a motion in a second. Um, because we have Commissioner Quinn online, we will do a roll call vote. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Yes. Commissioner Alternate Gildels Gittleson. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Yes. Commissioner Alternate McKeithen. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Pegler. Aye. And that was unanimous. Great, thank you. We'll go now to item 20, commissioner reports. Any reports from the commission this morning? Yes, please. I don't have a report, but before uh, Mitch leaves the room, uh, I wanna really thank him uh, for all his work on the labor negotiations. I mean, this is a, uh, while we haven't talked about it, and I don't think we should particularly, um, this is a major accomplishment of um, the staff Mitch um, and our labor negotiation uh, negotiators. So I really just, before you leave Mitch, you've been, um, I think you've been a really excellent interim director. Um, and I want to thank you for all your work on as an uh, interim director and as helping to bring these labor negotiations to conclusion. You're here. You don't have to run off. You're welcome to just hang out <laughs> if you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, any further uh, reports or comments from the commission? Okay, seeing none, we will go now to our director's report. Good morning, uh, commissioners and members of the public. Um, I've got a couple of updates this morning. Uh, I'd like to also um, have some remarks about the organizational restructuring that we completed. Items 12 and 13 on the consent agenda memorializes the organizational restructuring that the RDC has been working towards since 2020. Intended to improve the operations and performance of the agency by establishing three new departments, planning, programming, and transportation services, capital project delivery, and internal services. I'd like to thank the two labor units known as CORE and RAM, Special Advisor Mitch Weiss, the uh, RTC negotiating team, and the commission for their hard work, attention, and care to complete this restructuring process. The RTC will be actively recruiting for several positions in hopes of fully staffing our agency in 2025. And with that, I'd like to pause and um, give Mitch a going away gift that staff put together. <laughs> This is a, a photo of Mitch at one of our Sunshine Committee events. He had a great time um, kayaking with us off the wharf after work one day. And um, I don't know if you guys want to pass it around and take a look, but um, thank you very much, Special Advisor Weiss. I'm glad he stuck around because that would have been awkward. <laughs> uh, I have a staffing update for you this morning. We are pleased to welcome new staff member Sierra Top, who started on September 24th as a transportation planning technician. Ms. Top is a Santa Cruz local who recently completed her master's degree in urban design and planning from the University of Washington. She also has a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from UC Santa Cruz. Join me in welcoming Ms. Top to our team. <clears throat> I have an update on the 2025 labor negotiations. The term of the current labor memoranda of understanding for the two labor units ends April 1st, 2025. Included in the last MOU, the 2022 MOU that expires in April, was a commitment to perform a compensation study for consideration in the 2025 MOU negotiations. 
The compensation study is an important process for the commission to go through in order to keep our salaries and benefits in line with the market and keep our um, salaries in a, um, a place where we can um, attract and retain talented employees. Uh, yesterday, staff released a request for proposals to prefer a professional consultant to develop a compensation study with the goal of completing the final deliverables in advance of the term of the excuse me, the current MOUs. I will be the contract manager for this work and will bring subsequent information to the commission as it becomes available. An update on the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. Uh, we are very hard at work um, developing the concept and preparing for milestone three. That will be coming this fall. In advance of milestone three, we will be hosting several informational workshops that uh, will be either virtual or hybrid format in advance of commencing milestone three in November. The topics include project funding, service type, and a presentation by Caltrans on the Federal Railroad Administration Quarter Identification and Development Program or the Quarter ID Program. For more information on uh, attending these um, public workshops, please visit our website. The RTC recently kicked off the Rural Highway Safety Action Plan for Santa Cruz County. This plan seeks to enhance safety for all users along the county six undivided rural highways that serve as main streets, including Highway 1 along the North Coast, Highways 9, 236, 35, 129, and 152. The RTC will be hosting two virtual public community workshops on Wednesday, October 23rd and Thursday, October 24th. Both workshops will be held virtually and more information will be available um, very soon on our website. Biketober Santa Cruz started on October 1st. Along with our partners at Ecology Action, we invite all riders to join the online challenge to bike more and enjoy all the benefits that biking brings. Participants that sign up for Biketober will have the chance to enter prize drawings by riding their bike and encouraging others. Riders of every level are invited to participate. Visit the RTC website for more information. And finally, the RTC is um, implementing an equity action plan, <laughs> which was, excuse me, the RTC's uh, Caltrans planning grant that we received about a year ago for development of an equity action plan. Staff is working to hire a consultant to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the RTC's internal policies and procedures and to lead trainings for staff, the commission and committee members, as well as transportation stakeholders to advance equity and transportation planning, project implementation and agency operations. A request for proposals was released last week and staff will be bringing more information to the commission when available. And that concludes my director's report, thank you. Thank you. Any questions on the director's report? Seeing none, any public comment in the room? Any public comment online? Okay, thank you. We will now move on to our Caltrans report. Ms. Ryder is joining us alone. Okay, she's coming in now. Okay. All right, sorry about that. I'm having difficulty this morning with my uh, invite in, but Brandy Ryder, uh, Transportation Planner or Deputy District Director for Planning in uh, District 5. And I just have one announcement today. Uh, it's about our Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant Program. A, a correction from our last board meeting, uh, we had some dates incorrect. So our um, public comment period on the grant guidelines is extended until October 10th. And we will be having workshops on the grant gu guidelines on the 16th and 17th of October. There are uh, website and webinar information on our website. And then also just to extend to all the member agencies that if you're interested in a transportation planning uh, grant, when we do call for projects this year, we are going to be hosting not only a workshop for District 5 specifically, but some office hours. And so we'd like to extend an invitation to all the agencies interested in applying for grants to reach out to our team and we would be happy to assist. And with that, I can answer any questions that you might have this morning. 
Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, any public comment in the room? Any public comment online? Yes. Mr. Bernassa? Yes. Go ahead. No, give give me the give me the sound, please. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, my suggestion is is that Caltrans gets involved with the planning that we're going to talk about in item 23 uh, as to whether or not the trails being planned uh, are. Uh, class one, which the master plan for the scene for the scenic route uh, at Monterey scenic route calls for. And I think that's important. And I think that the uh, board should request Caltrans review of that. Thank you very much. Mr. Michael Saint. Mr. Saint? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm not getting an unmute button. So uh, anyway, well, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, morning, Ms. Ryder. I'm wondering, I was driving to the uh, Watsonville Airport yesterday morning, and I know there is shoulder work going on uh, past Freedom up to Buena Vista in that area. Uh, and where the lanes come down to two from three, Going southbound, I noticed uh, machinery on the uh, median side, the middle side of the freeway, taking out a large swath of uh, material, almost the size of a lane. Uh, I'm wondering if Caltrans is trying to widen it to three lanes to match the three lanes that are coming into it from north and south. Uh, I don't think there's supposed to be a highway widening project. Uh, between those, just shoulder work. Um, just curious. Um, don't know what's going on. Maybe Sarah can answer that or Caltrans, either one. Bye bye. That was our last speaker. All right. Thank you. Yeah, if, if uh, Ms. Ryder or Sarah, if either of you want to respond. So I'm I'm not sure the location specifically if it's a if it's a maintenance project I can definitely look into it. Um, typically, if it is a highway maintenance project or a shop project, it would not be a widening project. But I uh, would like to get more information about the specific location, and then we can follow up. If I may add, um, I am very familiar with this project because we were um, trying to work with Caltrans to extend bus on shoulder as part of that project, which ended up not happening. Uh, but it is only shoulder widening in the median, and it's a safety project uh, through the SHOP program that Caltrans is um, implementing. And, um, and unless I'm missing something, Brandy, maybe we could- No, you're right. I just got a note from uh, my team. So it is an inside shoulder widening for safety. It's a safety 010 project. It's a reactive or a uh, reactive safety project. So there is no widening associated with this one as far as lane widening. It's just simply a shoulder widening. Great, thank you both. Thank All you. right. With that, uh, we will move on to item 23, Coastal Rail Trail Segments 8 and 9 and Segments 10 and 11, Projects Construction Cost Reduction Strategies, Value Engineering Analysis, and Track Relocation Memorandum of Understanding with Roaring Camp Railroads. Good morning. Try again. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Grace Blakesley of your staff. Um, as Chair Brown said this morning, I'm here to present you an update on coastal rail, rail trail segments eight and nine and segments 10 and 11. Segments eight and nine extend from Pacific Avenue near the wharf in the city of Santa Cruz to 17th Avenue in the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County. Um, segments 10 and 11 extend from 17th Avenue um, in the unincorporated area of the county to State Park Drive um, in the area we call Aptos. My report today includes a discussion of funding summaries uh, for the two projects, um, a discussion of the RTC-led value engineering analysis and coordination with Roaring Camp Railroads to relocate the rail required to construct the trail as designed. Next slide, please. 
Um, I want to start off with a brief reminder about the project funding and project phases. Um, projects overseen by the RTC and other public agencies typically step through a comprehensive process before they're constructed and completed. Now, these often involve years of funding and excuse me, planning and funding strategy. Um, then they're typically followed by an environmental and preliminary design phase, then by final design and construction. And each of these phases require their own funding plan. It can often be challenging for public agencies to find funding for planning efforts and developing early concepts for projects. It can also be challenging to find funding for preliminary design and environmental, which are again part of the earlier stages of the phases of the project. Um, this is one reason that the passage of Measure D in 2016 is so instrumental in moving these projects forward. It allows us to advance, advance some of these earlier phases. Um, as shown on this slide, the planning efforts for the trail master plan and associated work was developed using a combination of federal earmark funds, funding from the California Coastal Conservancy, which continues to partner with RTC on coastal rail trail projects and RTC state designated planning funds. The environmental and preliminary design were funded by local funds, primarily from Measure D active transportation category and some Measure D local funds under the neighborhood category, which are allocated directly by the local jurisdictions. These early investments made these projects more competitive uh, for state and active transportation funding, which was awarded, uh, which provided funding for final design, right of way, and construction phases. And something I um, think is helpful to clarify um, in the project delivery world, we often refer to right of way, and folks think about only property acquisition. It's important to keep in mind this category also includes costs for environmental mitigation, which is a key component of something we've been discussing around the coastal rail trail projects. Next slide, please. Okay. As noticed on the noted in the previous slide, the successful active state active transportation planning grants provided funding for portions of coastal rail trail segments eight through eleven final design and the majority funding for the right of way and construction. Funding requests for these projects were based on cost estimates developed in two thousand and twenty two. Um, and it also included a 10 to 15% contingency. Um, these cost estimates for the two projects were updated in 2024, reflect industry-wide escalation, new information about environmental mitigation costs, and refine refinements to the design, primarily related to retaining wall types, alternative structures to reduce environmental impacts, which includes a um, addition of viaducts, which I'll talk a little bit later about, and a drainage plan for the trail within the right-of-way and next to the trail. Based on the 2023 cost bidding environment, um, this information was used to update the cost for the coastal rail trail projects in 2020, 2024 and resulted in a projected funding gap of 43 million. It's important to note here that construction cost estimates will continue to be updated throughout the project development. And although the cost can typically go up due to escalation, which is one reason project sponsors try to balance the need for cost reducing strategies that may delay project delivery with delivering projects as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Um, this slide provides a summary of the estimated project cost and estimated funding needs that I mentioned on the prior slide. The combined 16 million in additional funding for segments eight and nine, and the additional funding need for 27 at 27 to 28 million for segments 10 and 11, um, gets us to that 43 million funding gap for these projects that we've been discussing with you since April 2024. A key aspect to note in this table is that the cost increases are generally attributed to the increased right of way cost, again, including that environmental mitigation cost, as well as the construction cost estimates. Um, just to note, um, currently there is an update to, currently the city of Santa Cruz is updating their environmental mitigation plan for this project and updated costs. The costs are expected to come down. We are still working through those details. Um, we have brought to you previously discussions about different Measure D funding scenarios that close the potential funding gap. And we discussed this with you both in April 2024 and September 2024, but the RTC has not actually programmed any additional funding today. Should the RTC can decide to program additional funding, we would recommend that that be it occur at a later date when we have final project cost estimates and are closer to construction. 
And I wanna just note that we're, the cost estimates are on the screen right now were developed prior to the discussion we're gonna have now about cost reduction strategies. Next slide, please. So in response to the updated cost estimates that we were provided in 2024 that showed that $43 million funding gap, the RTC directed staff to pursue cost reduction strategies. Two cost reduction strategies pursued by staff include a value engineering analysis by an independent um, firm and develop a partnership with Roaring Camp Railroad that would transfer the cost of track relocation where needed to construct the trail next to the rail, to construct the trail next to the rail to the to Roaring Camp Railroad. The value engineering analysis was organized and funded by the RTC at a cost of approximately $50,000. Next slide, please. The findings of the value engineering analysis are included in attachment two of the staff report. Um, the analysis allows, this, this process that we went through, allows the design team and a facilitator without our history or knowledge of the project to review the project components and provide their perspective on design and costs. Although these teams don't have the benefit of working through all the project details that resulted in the current design, they are experts in their fields of design and construction. There's a real benefit um, to bring the value engineering team on board because they potentially have different backgrounds and experience and to evaluate the design approach that we're pursuing and discuss with the current designers um, what might be, might, might be an alternate approach to the project. The independent review resulted in several findings, as you'll see in attachment two. Um, it's estimated that these findings could result in cost savings of anywhere between 31 million and $62 million if all the recommendations were feasible and implemented. Some of the findings included reducing the trail width to reduce retaining walls required for construction, modifying wall designs, replacing viaducts with retaining walls, and changing the viaduct design, Delaying construction of sections of the trail or realigning it onto existing roadways and bicycle and pedestrian facilities or, and reusing track materials. Next slide, please. So one of the engineering uh, value engineering findings is to modify the design of the viaducts proposed in the project. And I just want to take a minute to provide you with some perspective of how we work through this process. So here are some images you might've seen before as part of the presentation of the coastal rail trail projects. And these are um, renderings of what a viaduct would look like um, when they're constructed next to the rail. Um, they're primarily uh, recommended as part of this project because they minimize environmental impacts in sensitive areas. What was identified in the analysis is that an alternative and potential less costly design from the construction standpoint would be to fill in this area with material and construct the top trail on top of the fill. This is a good example of where the team is considering trade-offs between costs and potential environmental impacts. Next um, slide, please. So the next two slides are just maps just to give you a quick idea of where some of the viaducts are located and, and you can kind of see how the design team worked through this process. So you'll see um, the red shows where viaducts are located. This is segment nine. Um, you have a viaduct that crosses over Pilkington Creek, um, one that approaches um, Woods Lagoon uh, or the harbor on both sides. And then as well, oh, as well as um, crossing over Leona Creek and um, I apologize, I just got um, progressive glasses and I'm, I'm still kind of working through this. Okay. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here's, a net, here's segment 10 viaducts. You can see that there are a number of them. Um, there's a very long one expanding around uh, New Brighton um, and then others around Boragas Creek um, and a, a couple others. So this is the kind of thing that the design team looked at and the, and the value engineer analysis looked at and then brought back to the design team. And now we're discussing where it makes sense to make some changes and where it does, may not make sense to make some changes. If you have specific questions about the specific viaducts, we have the city and county here to answer those. Next slide. Next, I'm sorry, go ahead and go ahead, ready. Okay, um, so Rail Rory Camp Railroad Memorandum of Understanding has been another key piece of the cost reduction strategies. 
and it would allow it to, to reuse the existing track uh, materials as identified in the value engineering analysis. But furthermore, it would transfer the cost of the track relocation outside of the trail project and to Roaring Camp Railroad. Roaring Camp Railroads has been working with RTC to help identify options and how we would do this and incorporate this as part of the project. Um, so far, we're about the 30% design level. We've identified about 10,000 feet of track for location required um, and to construct the 12 foot trail, 12 foot wide trail, the eight foot uh, tra paved trail, and then two foot shoulders on either side. We've estimated that the cost savings from asking Roaring Camp and working with Roaring Camp to relocate the track at their own expense would reduce the project cost for the two projects by $9 million. As a railroad operator, Roaring Camp is very well suited to complete this work. We want to recognize Roaring Camp's efforts and the collaboration that they have been working with us on to develop and enter into this memorandum of understanding. It's very significant for the coastal rail trail projects, and we really appreciate their work with us. Next. This slide just again to give you some reference shows where the um, where we anticipate having track relocation as part of the project. Here we have four um, different locations. Um, they include around Fifth Avenue in the unincorporated area, all the way out to Leona Creek. Um, they include the area from Live Oak Avenue to El Dorado, and east, and then again east of Seventeenth Avenue to Rodale Gulch Bridge, and then from Rodale Gulch Bridge um, out to Forty Seventh. Some of these areas are being revised based on the uh, value engineering analysis or being considered revised. And when we're talking about the track location, it's kind of helpful to think about how much. So you think about the track center line, and in some cases, it's as small as shift as if eight inches or something, and then other areas, it's more like eight feet. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so in terms of the project designers, now they are creating a scope of work to try to integrate some of the findings from the value engineering assessment. Um, this involves looking at retaining wall features um, that might be able to be changed to reduce costs, um, changing wall designs, um, updating the plans to remove the rail re relocation as part of the trail project. Um, project sponsors are not pursuing delaying portions of the project or the realignment of the trail outside of the right of way at this time. Um, of note, some of these changes are also uh, potentially increasing the cost to develop the final design for the project. In terms of coordinating with Roaring Camp, as part of the value um, engineering assessment um, recommendation to pursue the rail use, you'll see as item two on your staff report today um, that RTC rec staff recommends pursuing a Roaring Camp's railroad offer to relocate the track at their expense and entering into a memorandum of understanding, which would be followed by a temporary license agreement with Roaring Camp to do the work. Next slide, please. Um, so I received some questions um, from members of the public about why some value engineering findings are not being pursued. So I just wanted to touch on a few reasons. The reasons primarily include that it was identified as not feasible from a constructability standpoint when both the um, Coastal Rail Trail Project Design Team leads met with the value engineering analysis team. Um, potential new significant environmental impacts in some locations is a reason that we wouldn't pursue that um, strategy. Also, if there was a potential significant reduction in the project benefits. Um, in some cases, we looked at the concerns about being able to implement a recommendation because of regulatory uh, requirements. And then also in some cases, we found that the cost savings identified in the value engineering analysis may not be as significant as initially thought. I really want to recognize the collaboration with the City of Santa Cruz um, Segment 8 and 9 Project Manager Matt Starkey, who is here today, and the County of Santa Cruz Segment 10 and 11 Project Manager Rob Tidmore. The value engineering analysis has required significant collaboration with them and their design teams, and are here today if you do have specific questions about how that will be implemented as part of their design in the future. Uh, next slide. So before I want to wrap up, I want to touch up on a few touch on a few other things that are being worked on as part of the Coastal Rail Trail Project design. In addition to incorporating the value engineering analysis findings to the project design and removing the track relocation from the trail design project, RTC is also working with project sponsors to potentially adjust the trail design to accommodate future passenger rail 
as aligned and envisioned in the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. Um, this is a way that we're trying to strategize to reduce any future uh, throwaway costs for these projects. Um, the, pro the project team, you know, including RTC and the city and county, recognize that there may need to be future adjustments to the trail alignments when there's passenger rail is constructed. But we're working to avoid changes that require significant changes to expensive infrastructure like the viaducts or retaining walls. Um, also, I wanted to note that the project team for the city of Santa Cruz is considering new design options for the trail crossing at Woods Lagoon, which is at the harbor, um, based on a recent seismic study of the railroad bridge across the Santa Cruz Harbor. Uh, the current design assumed that the trail would be cantilevered off the railroad bridge, and the design team is now exploring all other options. And I wanted to note this because this may increase design costs. Um, we have Staff will return to you with additional details about what the city is considering um, for this, this crossing when more information is available. One more slide. Okay, so on the, we've talked a lot about the cost side. So in part, talk more about the increased funding side. Um, in April, the commission also directed staff to continue to pursue outside funding uh, for these projects. I wanted to let you know that our TC staff has submitted applications for three different federal grant programs. These federal grant programs are highly competitive. RTC and the Coastal Rail Trail projects receive the highest ranking the project can receive in their 2024 raise application. It was not one of the approximately 150 of the 350 projects that received this ranking um, from the board. RTC is working to improve the raise application to be more competitive as part of the 2025 raise cycle. <laughs> which will, um, grants are due, I believe, January, February next year. RTC staff also recently submitted both a federal, it's a similar kind of a active transportation program grant, and as well as a reconnecting communities grant. And this is the first time the RTC has applied for these programs and we're still waiting to hear back. I wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge Max Friedman of RTC staff, who has been at RTC less than a year, but led development of both the ATP and um, reconnecting communities grant. Also on the funding side, a reminder that state funding for these pro projects was programmed in 2022. And at this point, RTC staff has not identified new state funding source for these projects, but we will consider to pursue grant opportunities as they arise. And then again, these projects are both recipients of Measure D Active Transportation category funds, which are programmed by RTC. Other funding options for trail projects the RTC can consider are the Regional Surface Transportation Program funds, and the state transportation improvement funds programmed by RTC as part of their consolidated grant program. The next call for projects for the consolidated grant program will be in fall 2025. Last slide here, the staff recommendations. So today, um, staff recommend that you're receiving this information I've provided on the cost reduction strategies and um, funding pursuits and that you provide uh, authorized executive director to enter into a memorandum of understanding with Roaring Camp Railroads for the relocation of the tracks as needed to allow for the construction of the coastal rail trail within the rail right of way. Includes my report. Thank you. Uh, any questions from commissioners? We're a quiet group today. Okay, uh, with that, we will go to public comment on this item. We'll start with any public comment in the room. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Coming back to um, that, that's an excellent report, and I'm glad to hear some of the new news that's coming, and thank you for the comprehensive update. Um, you know, it's been a moving target in, in some sense, um, and I appreciate your candor and transparency in the, um, but I've been consistent uh, for years in voting for rail trail studies and trans, uh, the trail segment, and uh, I, I'm, it's cost us millions of dollars, and I'm glad we've done it. We needed to do it. Um, but the data and information are critical for us to make good decisions in the future. And I've also uh, been consistent in expressing my concerns about the escalating costs, um, some of which were, are many of which were in your report, um, and not just in all um, RTC projects, not just the rail trail. 
And because of asked hard questions have been asked, have been painted as an anti-rail, which is not consistent with my voting record, but uh, I don't want to get defensive about this, but I do care about costs. And uh, I know that uh, you have mentioned that and we all do, I think, care about the costs and we have a responsibility to um, the public who trusted us with how we're going to spend this measure D money. And we often hear from RTC commissioners that cost overruns are common for all transportation projects, uh, which is true. We're finding out. I found that out in the last 12 years. Uh, but in my memory, no other transportation project about additional RTC <clears throat> funding has approached the amount over the original estimates the staff reports uh, in segments 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, when we recently talked about uh, the $5 million more for the improvement that's needed for uh, Highway 1, uh, there was cleared the concern from, more, uh, from many of the RTC commissioners. But $5 million is certainly not a 29% increase over the original cost estimates uh, of segments 8 through 11. Um, I appreciate and I really appreciate Roy and Camp uh, stepping up forward to move the rails where it's needed uh, to lower the cost to taxpayers, which is only fair because they are going to be the principal user of those uh, of that line. Uh, still, the public uh, private partnership is really helpful and it's much it's much appreciated. I, I do predict that the level of cost um, and logistical challenges in this report is just the beginning of a story where the RTC is um, can expect to hear next year when the zero emission passenger rail concept report is presented. I still believe um, it is imperative that we leave all options open for the best use of the rail trail corridor, including the possibility of uh, commuter rail and aim to make a good project decisions as we go along. Um, but remember, for example, that the ultimate trail is $304 million more to build than the interim trail on segments eight through 12 uh, at the current estimates. Um, and even though um, we uh, that issue is not before us today, it should be give us all some pause, I think. Um, and I know it does. I mean, I, I know that uh, there's a concern with costs for everyone. And even though the issue is not before us today, um, I think that um, we have to ask why why the $304 million more? Because it maintains the current rails that really cannot be used for future community uh, passenger rail or service. Uh, and that's a concern. And, and why do the current rails need to be maintained at such a huge extra expense? Um, we can't trust one another enough to plan the future uh, commuter rail next to an affordable trail we can build now. Um, lastly, I want to state once again that we need to honor the formulas established for the Measure D as we promised the voters we would back in 2016 and that South County uh, should get its fair share of the Measure D active transportation funds so that their rail trail segments uh, will be improved as much as the mid and northern county segments. Um, I hope the future RTCs uh, will show the public that you care about what the projects cost in the context of all transportation projects and make some sound decisions. Um, I, I think this is very valuable information. I'm really pleased with uh, Roaring Camp's participation in it. And, uh, but I'm really concerned about these costs and that further delays, I have never seen <clears throat> where costs are reduced with further delays. And I'm not, you weren't expected to come and say, this is the final final of what we should do today. But, uh, we should, in um, the years to come, uh, these costs are escalating at a huge rate, and uh, it's a real concern to me, and I think the general public as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, Commissioner Schifrin and then but, Commissioner Gittleson. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report. Very helpful information in terms of where we are right now. Um, it's unclear where we will be. Uh, should we be successful in getting some of these grants? I wanted to clarify one thing that I maybe mentioned and I missed it in the staff report. It does say that the environmental review for the uh, segments 8 through 11 have been completed, but I don't remember it saying that these both 
these segment eight, nine, and ten and eleven have been approved by both the RTC and the county and the city where relevant. Is that not the case? Um, that is the case. Um, the city of Santa Cruz approved the ultimate trail design as their preferred alternative, and the county of Santa Cruz approved the um, ultimate moving forward with the ultimate trail design as well. Um, the RTC, um, in terms of the action on the alignment, directed staff uh, no approved a commitment to pursuing the ultimate trail at their design at their April meeting. Okay, thank you. So, and th the other thing, since we've had some talks about a cheaper alternative, um, that means we would rip up, rip up, the interim trail means we rip up the rail line. And I think it's important to keep that in mind as we negotiate with a, a partner, the Roaring Camp, to move the rail line, um, that we're moving forward with a dual purpose strategy of preserving the rail line, hopefully for ultimately compute, uh, some kind of passenger service while we build a usable trail for the public adjacent to it. And the costs are a concern. There's no two ways about it. It is unclear at this point whether we'll be successful in finding the funding to be able to do that. Um, but I think the commission's commitment to looking for ways of moving these projects forward represent a real um, commitment to the public to provide an amenity that will be a benefit to pedestrians and bike riders for uh, generations. So I just think it's important to point out the context in which this is all going on. We're uh, on a, a long path, as it turns out, trying to get to conclusion um, to build this public amenity. And I really appreciate all the work that the staff is doing to figure out a way to deal with what are very real um, environmental and fin financial issues that need to be resolved and challenges that need to be overcome. So uh, thank you. Yes, based on the commission action at your April meeting, um, uh, approving a commitment to move forward with the ultimate trail design, we did not analyze the option of ripping up the tracks and rail banking as part of the value of engineering analysis. Hi, good morning. I want to use the opportunity to thank Roaring Camp for coming up to bat and uh, just appreciate that very much and encourage us to expedite the approval of that aspect of it. And I also want to say, um, move the whole project forward as an alternate. I left my home 13 miles um, away at eight o'clock and didn't get here until 9.20. And I'm in a single car, and it doesn't matter if it's electric or hybrid or whatever, there are still um, hundreds of people on that highway that are lost opportunity. And the faster we can get the trail built and the rail line useful for passenger, I think it's a positive move. So thank you. Since we're in comments, I'll I'll make mine now. Um, I just want to say echo my my appreciation for uh, Grace for your work uh, and um, Matt and and Robert and all of the staff that you're working with um, at your respective agencies uh, as well. Uh, Roaring Camp. I'm going to repeat that just because I think it's really important to recognize that uh, we have a, a private business that is um, all in to help make this project uh, work. And uh, they are, in, and as Ms. Sarka suggested in the correspondence, Milani Clark has committed uh, and contributed so much of her time to uh, try to work through this with us. And so I just want to say that to me, when I add that all up, what I see uh, is uh, a community and with the respective agencies and partners who are really committed to making this work. And while the cost increases are daunting, uh, I believe that because of that commitment and, uh, you know, and, and, and positive uh, sense of, of what's possible, we're going to make this happen. And it is a resource question, but we are, as you said, competitive to uh, receive additional funds as a self-help county and as uh, a commission that is is working is now working to move forward. 
And I, I just want to say that this stands in significant contrast to what I experienced and, and many of us experienced uh, over several years. You know, I didn't know that I didn't think we'd be at this place, given the contentiousness and the attempts to kind of undermine moving forward that we've we've experienced. I didn't expect to see this during my time on the commission, and I'm just so thrilled. So thank you. Any additional questions at this time? We have Commissioner Keto's Carter. Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I just also wanted to echo some of the sentiments and um, I'm really excited to hear about this uh, MOU with Warren Camp. I really appreciate them um, stepping in and assisting. Um, thank you, Grace. I really appreciate that you took the time to address some of the questions and comments from the public. I think that's really important. So thank you for doing that. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, uh, like Commissioner Brown, I also didn't think we would get to this point, but I'm really glad that we have. And um, hopefully we can make this happen. I am one of the commuters, many commuters. I spend um, about four hours a day going to and from Santa Cruz. So it would be really amazing if I didn't have to do that every single day. Um, and I think it's not really a mystery why costs have gone up. Um, we've got inflation building materials are more expensive just everything's more expensive all around but again just a big thank you to roaring camp for all their work in supporting this thank you grace um and that is it for me thank you thank you yes go ahead i just have a quick question about the uh cost savings from roaring camp is that included in the uh projected 31 to $62 million cost savings from the value engineering study? Good question. Actually, the, a portion of it is. So that um, the portion that's included in the 31 to 60 million is the track reuse, but the cost savings associated with actually having Roaring Camp um, do the work is not um, included in that. Do you know the difference between those two amounts of money? Approximately. For the, for City of Santa Cruz, we looked at the track reuse is was about six hundred about seven hundred thousand dollar savings. So, and then the cost of the um, removing uh, the work by Warren Camp was closer to around two million dollars. So it's much more significant than the actual cost of savings from reusing the tracks. And you kind of have a similar breakdown for the. Um, County of Santa Cruz, the cost savings for Roaring Camp to actually complete the work. And that also means removing the um, work associated from of grading and um, constructing additional walls for the rail. So those are all included. So let me just kind of summarize the city of Santa Cruz. We estimated about 2 million in cost savings for Roaring Camp to complete the track relocation and about 7 million for county the work done in the county of Santa Cruz as part of segments 10 and 11. And then uh, the remaining of that, uh, there was the smaller portion of that is for the um, actual track reuse. So I'm sorry, I'm not quite following. We have, a, I saw a cost savings of $9 million from Roaring Camp, how many millions of dollars were included in the value engineering estimates and how many are not accounted for? Uh, good morning, Chair Brown, Commissioners. Uh, Rob Tidmore uh, from the County of Santa Cruz and the Project Manager for uh, Segments 1011. Um, to your question, so the VA analysis showed that there would be $3.3 million in savings from reusing the railroad tracks, which is, as Grace said, less than what we are saving by having Roaring Camp to actually do the track relocation work because the, the VA analysis still assumed that the track relocation would be part of the project scope, meaning that we would the, the county would pay a contractor to relocate the tracks. But instead of using new tracks, which was in the original cost estimate, they would simply relocate the existing tracks. What Roaring Camp is proposing is to go above and beyond that, which is rather than hiring a contractor that is part of the rail trail projects, we would have Roaring Camp go out and move the tracks themselves, including all of the grading work and potentially reducing the amount of retaining walls that were needed to hold up adjacent grades where the was needed for, for the railroad re, uh, relocation. So does that answer your question? So $3.3 million of the projected VA savings came from the, the track reuse. Sure. Okay. So it would be what? Five, 5.5. 5 in, in addition? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, about that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Got yeah. It. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Any further questions or comments from the commission? Okay. With that, we will take it to public comment and we will start with those in the room. Hi, welcome. Good morning, uh, Chair Brown and commissioners. Okay. And uh, I'd like to open by just saying I want to also thank Mitch Weiss for the service he provided while he was here. He's a special person and uh, he did a very important job, I think, that was needed by our community and this agency. Um, I'd like to mention that um, Roaring Camp has done a very extraordinary thing here and people can debate whether you know, it's a requirement under the license agreement or whatever, but in fact, on the ground, they are making a significant contribution, which we know at least is worth $9 million. And um, I think we shouldn't look away from that or um, try and overanalyze its impact. Finally, I'd like to say that uh, this is a pretty extraordinary project in terms of the cooperation between the RTC as an agency, the city of Santa Cruz and the county. And um, the fact that all those individual agencies are agreeing on a, on a project alternative in terms of value engineering, it tells you that first of all, they are following the direction that they've seen from our community in the vote on Measure D in 2016, and then the commitments from the participant agencies, yourself, the County of Santa Cruz, and the City of Santa Cruz. So I think the political will of our community is clear. Secondly, your staff has really looked at these cost savings potentials and they support alternative B and that thing, I think that's where we should be moving. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. I'm back. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Chair Brown, uh, Rob Tidmore again, County Santa Cruz. Um, I just want to thank commissioners uh, and RTC staff, particularly Grace, uh, Sarah, and Riley for, for your support and their support of the VA analysis and the VA team for their design and expertise. It was a really helpful process to go through. And while you know we ultimately we decided not to implement some of the suggestions that were made in there, I think it was overall a very useful and helpful exercise um, to, to go through. And, and um, many of you have noted this is a partnership. I just want to reinforce that the county is, is committed to this partnership and committed, committed to finding ways to reduce costs uh, for this project. Um, also like to thank Roaring Camp for their willingness uh, to do so as well. This is really a, a group effort to get such a big uh, and complicated and important project off of the ground and, and moving forward. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, the sort of the like the the magnitude of the cost overruns that Commissioner McPherson noted uh, as a project manager for the, for the project and the person who wrote and submitted the grant application. I, I take responsibility for that. I will note that the the challenge and part of the reason for those is that due to the historic nature of the amount of funding that was available in the cycle six ATP funds, we had an additional $650 million that came from the state general fund. We felt like that was a really historic opportunity to go for um, what are what were very large amounts of funding. And so when we submitted those grant applications, the, the design wasn't as complete as it maybe should have been or, or you know could have been for us to figure out what all those costs were. Um, I think we could all agree that that was a valiant or a valid uh, and worthwhile effort given the amount of funding that we got. So I just want to acknowledge that those are large, large cost overruns. We're working to reduce those. But part of the reason we did that was just simply to meet that those um, historic um, grant funding opportunities. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any further comment in the room? Seeing none. Uh, we will go to online. And before we go to our online Zoom comments, I apologize. I believe I overlooked Commissioner Quinn had his hand raised. Commissioner Quinn, would you like to make your, your comments or questions now, or do you want to wait until after uh, public comment? Well, my question is quick, and I appreciate that recognition, uh, Chairperson Brown. My question is simple. With the rail tracks being moved, uh, number one, have, has the change in right-of-way and setbacks been accounted for? And number two, are to be a little bit facetious, are they being moved symbolically or are they actually be functional? 
Um, thank you for that question. Um, so the intention is to relocate the tracks to mimic the existing condition, which has the setback for freight that um, we've been assuming uh, throughout the early project development and is now being re reviewed as part of the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. And in terms of the usability of the tracks, once they are relocated, um, the draft, the MOU with Roaring Camp and the draft license we have describes the track being relocated in a condition which is class one. Um, and before the tracks could be reused, they would be activated, they would need to be re um, reviewed by the California Public Utilities Commission as well as the Federal Railroad Association. So um, the intention is yes, that they would be able to be used for certain purposes as needed. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies for the uh, overlooking your hand there, Commissioner uh, Quinn. We will no go, worries. We will go back now to public comments uh, on Zoom. Michael Saint. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Brown and commissioners. Um, I don't think there's uh, probably anyone that's a fan of reducing the scope of work uh, or putting the trail portions of the trail outside of the rail corridor. Um, but I also understand that costs have skyrocketed and you are working towards solutions, which is deeply appreciated. After reading item 23, I did not see any mention of using our Measure D tax measure money as a tool to obtain financing for shortfalls uh, for grant, uh, grant funding or higher inflation issues. Have you considered leveraging our Measure D funds to uh, fill some of this void? Although we are in the midst of studying the zero emissions train and rail corridor for its cost feasibility, there is a good chance this too will come in at a very high cost. Why aren't we investigating or at least talking to other jurisdictions and counties that are considering public-private partnerships to get our funding increased through the private parties? Um, and possibly scaling down our goals of train size. There's very little uh, use or even future use for freight usage of this corridor up through Santa Cruz for freight. We need to live within our means. Our tax base is very small here in Santa Cruz County. And something like a very small light rail or even a public uh, or personal rapid transit could save a lot of money. We could continue the trail as well as have passengers service. Thank you for your time. Mr. Bernassa. Is my first slide up? Give me one second here. First slide. I'm working on it. Give me one second. Okay, sorry. Okay, it's up. If, okay, what you see is a uh, picture that's on page 23.9 of the agenda which depicts what it's going to look like and it's going to give it's going to be between seven uh, 10 to 12 typical feet uh, not too much traffic and uh, a separation from the railroad well that isn't quite true um because 584 uh vehicles and uh, bikes and pedestrians were estimated in 2019 to be peak traffic on nine and 10, segments nine and 10. And so I've dotted in what that might look like. Uh, and that makes it a little more crowded. In fact, it makes it uh, a D and F for uh, both 10 and 12 when you value it. Uh, and that's not all. Uh, number three uh, shows the fact that for a class one trail, uh, you need to have distance from obstacles, fences, walls, buildings, posts, rocks, even I would imagine trimmed manzanita. 
and uh, and there's two, preferably three feet on each side. We'll all use two feet. So that drops that down to six to eight feet. And then we have another problem. And the problem is when you start with passengers, you're going to have to move the, pe the fence because that's 12 feet, not eight feet like freight, under 15 miles an hour of freight. So there you are. It's unusable. It flunks every test of safety. In fact, you set goals in July uh, of 24 and are all been negated. For instance, uh, the last, please, number five. Uh, please uh, conclude your comments, sir. Okay, well, anyway, the safety, that slide shows all the safety items you talked about. You violated them all. It's not going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Joanna Lighthill. Good morning, commissioners. Um, please delay trail construction on segments 9, 10, and 11, and please do not authorize Roaring Camp to move the tracks. If the tracks are moved, they'll need to be moved again for passenger rail. Um, this is a short-term solution that is inconsistent with the Commission's long-term goal of implementing passenger rail service. It was after the Commission approved the ultimate trail that your rail consultants explained more than once that the setbacks used in the existing trail plans are insufficient for passenger rail service and only suitable for existing rail conditions, which is occasional slow-moving freight on a line that's currently out of service. If you stick with the current plan, you are planning for freight rail service only. Once this work is done and you build the ultimate trail, if you decide to implement passenger rail, not only will the tracks need to be moved again, but on segment 10 be between 30th and 47th Avenue, uh, the trail would be uh, need to be removed or narrowed. Modifying the trail would of course reduce the benefits that were promised in the funding application submitted to the CTC. It looks like there's some modified trail designs, but even if those are used, the corridor still isn't wide enough. That plan would require taking additional right of way from adjacent homes on the south side of the tracks. And I don't think these right of way costs are included in those that were described today. Commissioners, there's no benefit to moving the tracks now. You are not eliminating costs, just deferring them. Roaring Camp still cannot pass unless the line is repaired. And today's agenda states that the RTC is giving them a licensing agreement, the terms of which are not specified. Moving and saving old tracks is not going to help commuters. Please delay the construction and track relocation and wait for the Zeppert team to provide the refined alignment this fall. We need more information. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian Peoples with Trail Now. We've submitted our comments to item number 23. I just want to uh, re-agree with Commissioner McPherson. We can't afford this ultimate trail. I also want to agree with what Joanna Light uh, Lighthill mentioned about everything that we don't want to continue down this path of building a train track that won't work. Roaring Camp is actually trying to prevent us from building the trail. You're putting Roaring Camp over the community by accommodating their train tracks that they will never use. You're actually tearing out low-income housing along the tracks over Roaring Camp. What we're asking you to do is listen to Guy Preston, the former RTC uh, executive director who uh, years ago recommended the interim trail. And this commission failed to follow his guidance. He was the expert. If we had done what Guy had recommended, we would have a trail all the way to Watsonville and we had opened up that corridor. People are suffering with traffic. And that corridor should be open right now. The interim trail is the, the solution. And you, this organization is delaying the construction of the trail. 
And the evidence is the fact that you built 1.1 miles per year. You, you built one mile of trail over a decade. And this is going to continue to be the path you are going because you are recklessly trying to build a trail to accommodate a train that will never arrive. So please do not approve this. Don't have Roaring Camp move the tracks and move forward with the interim trail. Thank you. Ms. Rosemary Sarka. Unmute. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to um, acknowledge on behalf of Roaring Camp the appreciation shown by commissioners and by staff and acknowledge how uh, cooperative and helpful staff has been in this process. Um, I would also reiterate that Roaring Camp's effort to move the tracks is based on simply a good neighbor effort. I want to take this opportunity to dispel the misconception referred to by Commissioner McPherson that Roaring Camp would be the principal use of the tracks. Uh, Roaring Camp has never been the carrier on the that branch line. Uh, Roaring Camp does not have any such intention at this time. I think it's probably a little difficult for people to accept the fact that somebody would do something just to be a good neighbor. But that is the case in this situation. The license agreed, uh, uh, referred to by a prior speaker is only a license to enter the property owned by the RTC. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, further dispel any misconceptions and rumors which have been too prolific in this situation. Thank you. Gary Scott. Thank you, uh, commissioners, and thank you, staff, for putting together a, 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 a fantastic uh, value uh, analysis uh, report. I, I want to uh, uh, echo Rosemary's uh, comments and, and uh, point out that Roaring Camp is, is just a, a part of our, our community and a part of our DNA. They're really humble. They, they perform evacuations and trash removal and vegetation management. And, and never never brag about it. Um, this service that they're offering is is remarkable and and uh, great thanks to to Roaring Camp for this. Um, on the value analysis, I'm really encouraged to see that, and I thank staff for the hard work to look at ways a gigantic project like this being undertaken by our small county uh, needs to be done incrementally. And the the recommendations make great sense. There are parts of it that don't need to be built all at once. There are parts of it that with a little extra time can be made better. So I, uh, I hope that many of these uh, measures will be, will be taken. And I wanna speak to uh, this idea that the rail, the trail has to be done in a certain fashion. There are sections where putting, putting the trail in with the rail makes no sense. And one, one uh, I, I would rather be away from the trains. I'd rather not be separated from neighborhoods by a fence. I'd rather be out on the street in certain segments, one of which is uh, between Monterey and Coronado streets, which goes along Park Avenue. The one alternative that the, actually the, the current plan puts the, puts the uh, trail in the hillside separated from the neighborhoods by a fence and by the railroad when it might do better to be uh, out on Park Avenue as described in the value analysis. So good job, go forward, thanks very much. Thank you, it looks like I don't see any further comment online. That is correct. Okay, well then we will bring it back to the commission. We'll start with Commissioner Schifrin, oh, and then we'll go to Commissioner Brown. Okay. The comment that um, Mr. Tidmore made about the process of getting the grant for this, uh, the grants for the, the the segments, really pointed out to me and made 
you know, it's important to recognize the work that staff does. It's important to recognize the support from um, the Roaring Camp. But really, this whole process, these, pro these projects are driven by the state and federal government. If we didn't get the outside funding um, that we've gotten, and if we don't get the, the uh, additional uh, funding that we need, these projects aren't going to get done. And I think they come out of a changing understanding uh, at a state and federal level that there need to be alternatives to just widening highways. That hot, widening highways are not sufficient to solve the transportation problems. And there's been a growing understanding that providing additional um, priority to alternatives like uh, the rail trail is really critical. Um, so there are sort of two important points here. I think one is just uh, thanks to our federal and state representatives for the support that they give to this, uh, the grants for the for these projects. And the other thing is to recognize how uh, the whole process is really driven by the when we apply for those grants. The fact that we had to apply for grants before we had a good understanding about what the cost might be seems to be a reasonable explanation about why they turned out to be uh, uh, low because unfortunately, if we had had to, uh, information, we probably would have applied for more money. Um, and we would not necessarily be in this situation. So it seems to me that um, we're, you know, we're moving forward with projects and our ability to do so is going to be not only our partnerships locally, but our support from our federal and state elected officials and the agencies that grant the funding uh, for these kinds of projects. They've been critical and they will be critical. So uh, uh, I'm willing to make the motion to support the staff recommendation. Second, and here, here. That's all I got. <laughs> Any further comments? Yes, please, Commissioner Johnson. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I guess listening to the staff report, listening to um, everybody involved, county, city of Santa Cruz, um, that we should be popping champagne because, um, you know, things are just going so well and we're pivoting in such a fantastic manner. But when you have cost overruns like this, um, it begs the question, you know, we're now going to move into a value engineering mode. And I think average people will say, why aren't we there already? Why aren't we looking for value? Why aren't we engineering? You know, some of the comments um, are pejorative from the standpoint that if you make comments like I'm making right now, um, you're trying to undermine, okay? But I, but I harken back to, you know, votes on certain things where everybody was optimistic. Um, progressive rail. Uh, it's been a while, maybe, what is it, seven, eight years, where uh, we granted them the, the rights for their uh, time on the track. How's that working out? Some of us said it will never work. Were we trying to undermine things, or were, were we trying to be realistic, saying there are warning signs here, okay? So I'm not saying we should be wearing black armbands today, but what I am saying is that, you know, Measure D 2016, promises were made. And when you make promises, keeping those promises are the highest priority. Now, I don't know if we're keeping those promises or not, but to me, what I'm seeing is in terms of a quote value engineering is diminishing, shortening, um, scaling down to meet the cost overruns that I think everybody kind of anticipated. Um, you know, we do have to pivot. Every, I think every project has its challenges. Um, but when the public sees um, these types of cost overruns, do they, are they optimistic, sanguine about the prospects of what will come next? You know, this whole project, the ultimate trail is going to, um, I think, center upon a 
public tax measure. Okay. Now, with this kind of experience in which you say we're going to do it here, but then the cost jumps 25, 35, 50%, what kind of confidence do they think the taxpayers are going to have on future endeavors, future measures? I think it's going to be diminished. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that people are, are saying, hey, this is a, a great job. Um, you know, uh, really, really appreciate staff, and I appreciate staff too. But this is not a great day for the RTC. This is not a great day to pontificate that, man, we're moving forward. I didn't think we'd be in this place or whatever. The place we're in right now is not a good place if you're having cost overruns like we're talking about today and diminishing and making less. Because again, promises made, promises kept is a, a really not only an endearing thing, but it's a responsibility. And have we lived up to that responsibility? I'm not really sure. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Any online? Right, doesn't look like it. Okay, all right. Uh, with that, we will bring it back to the commission. We have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Alternate Gittleson? Yes. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn, which I believe departed. Commissioner Alternate McKeithen? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Pegler? Aye. And that passes with one no. All right, thank you. We will move on now to item 24, Highway 9 Boulder Creek Complete Streets Project Cooperative Agreement with Caltrans and Consultant Contract with HMH Engineers. Good morning, Commission. Good morning, Commissioners. Brian Zamora of your staff here to give a quick update on the Highway 9 Boulder Creek Complete Streets project. Um, this project is a project we're really excited for and think the community of Boulder Creek will benefit a lot from. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Uh, next slide, please. So the Highway 9 Boulder Creek Complete Streets project is located on Highway 9 and Highway 236 in Boulder Creek up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. This is a corridor that experiences high vehicle and pedestrian traffic, making it a priority for infrastructure improvements. Um, the current phase we're in is a project approval and environmental document phase, also known as a PAED phase. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Moving on to the project goals. Um, some of the key objectives are enhancing pedestrian safety and accessibility, uh, filling gaps in the sidewalk network, implementing traffic calming measures, improving bicycle and transit facilities, and supporting the community's overall uh, commercial area with better infrastructure. Uh, moving on to the project scope, some of the main infrastructure improvements are adding new sidewalks. If you've ever been to Boulder Creek, you know that there's a lot of gaps in the sidewalk network and sometimes no sidewalk at all, making it super dangerous and unsafe for pedestrian travel along the corridor. Um, so this project aims to implement continuous sidewalks along the corridor for safe pedestrian travel. In addition, there will also be curb extensions and bulb outs added. Um, curb extensions not only make it um, more visible for pedestrians to cross streets and safer, it also reduces vehicle speed along the corridor. Um, crosswalk striping will also be included. Uh, another traffic calming method would be will be center islands uh, all along the corridor. This is a uh, highway and very much well treated as a highway, but we want to make it as safe as possible for the community of Boulder Creek. Um, transit stop enhancements and also drainage and stormwater management will be part of the project. <laughs> Moving on to the co-op, uh, this project will be in cooperation with Caltrans. Um, a cooperative agreement is currently being worked on with RTC being the project sponsor and the implementing agency and managing the project schedule, scope, and the budget. 
and also overseeing the consultant and planning community outreach events. Um, Caltrans will be the lead agency for CEQA and NEPA, uh, in, in charge of environmental document review and approval, and also provide quality management and oversight. Next slide, please. <laughs> Moving on to the consultant selection. Um, in April, the RTC staff released an RFP soliciting for qualified consultants for the PAED phase for the Highway 9 Boulder Creek Complete Streets Project. Some of the evaluation criteria used to select the consultant was their experience, their approach to the project, and their qualifications. And the firm selected was HMH Engineers with a contract value of $1,337,216. Um, this contract will be fully funded by a $1.5 uh, million uh, federal earmark. And the rest of the money from the earmark will be rolled over to cover uh, staff costs while working on this project. Next slide, please. So RTC staff recommends authorizing the executive director to negotiate a cooperative agreement with Caltrans for the PAED phase for the Highway 9 Boulder Creek Complete Streets project, as well as awarding the professional engineering services agreement to the top ranked for HMH for the PAED phase of the Highway 9 Boulder Creek Complete Streets project. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Well, I, I just would, uh, th this is fantastic news uh, as being the representative of the fifth district in Boulder Creek. And I wanna thank um, once again, Con Con Congress member uh, Anna Eshu, who earmarked a uh, million and a half dollars in 2023 to cover the pre-construction work for this project moving along. And uh, in 2013, when I was first uh, came into public service as a county supervisor, one of the first things I did was organize a, a bus tour of with Caltrans, RTC, the county and school districts and pedestrian bike safety in Boulder Creek was really the top priority. Uh, it was throughout the Highway 9, but it really uh, with all the traffic going to Big Basin and so forth, uh, it really focused on Boulder Creek. And there was one corner where several pedestrian fatalities or near fatalities had taken place. And um, the, the remedies that we're proposing here or we're going to be getting into are going to make this a much safer place uh, in a highly traveled area uh, of the 5th District and uh, the Boulder Creek community be very happy. Uh, with this, and I can't thank staff enough, and again, Congresswoman uh, Eshoo for uh, getting the grant to get us on track to make this a reality. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. You know, um, this is, I'll echo what um, um, Supervisor McPherson said in terms of this is a fantastic project, and it exemplifies the need for these types of projects countywide. Every community has this type of, of need, of concerns, of and wanting improvements for their locals because it's something that they see, they recognize could be danger from for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and um, forever. And so a really nice report that you did. Um, and um, I think it's going to be uh, really good for the people of the 5th District. <laughs> Any further questions or comments from the commission? Uh, oh, yes. I apologize. I didn't call on Commissioner Kedos Carter for the previous item. Okay. I think that's what she is raising her hand for. Yes, that, that was my comment, but I also want to echo um, the sentiments of the other commissioners. Um, the, I recently came back from a trip from, to the Netherlands um, where we were looking at um, infrastructure for pedestrian and bike safety. So this project is really, it makes me super, super happy. Um, and bike and pedestrian safety um, makes roads safer for everyone. So really happy about this project as well. Thank you. Thank you. And then do you want to register your um, vote for the last vote? Yes, my vote is uh, aye. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, with no further comments from the commission, we will go now to public comment. Any in the room? Seeing none, we will go to Zoom. Mr. Helmer. Jim Helmer.
you're on mute. No. Mr. Helmer, can you hear us? Okay. All right. Well, with that, uh, we'll bring it back to the commission for any further discussion and a vote. Uh, if Mr. Helmer happens to unmute himself um, while we're in that process, we'll come back to him for any comments he'd like to make. Okay, uh, we're back to the commission. Second. Okay, we have a motion. Did you get the motion in the second? Uh, Commissioner McPherson and Schifrin? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Alternate Gittleson? Here, Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate McKeithen? Aye. Commission, uh, Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Pegler? Aye. And Commissioner Kitos Carter? Aye. That passes unanimously. All right. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of our meeting. It's amazing. It's not <laughs> even 11 o'clock yet. Yeah. What are we going to do with all this time we're getting back? Um, our next RTC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, November 7th at 9 a.m. at the Watsonville City Council Chambers. Until then, uh, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Our meeting is adjourned. You should take credit for that.